الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته Welcome back inshallah to another session in our program for Tazkiyah for Teens um, Inshallah in this session we're going to be covering something very beautiful and hopefully something that uh, will be very powerful and make a powerful effect in your lives uh, but before we get to that, let's do a quick recap over some of the topics that we've covered this far, thus far. Uh, firstly, we cover the topic of revelation and revelation being revolutionary in its message, in its meaning, and its, in, uh, in its ability to change our lives from darkness into light. Uh, the second topic that we covered was that of happiness and the idea that happiness can be defined in many ways. One way is to understand the facets of happiness, uh, the intensity, the duration of happiness and the quality. Uh, but the definition that was most appealing to myself and most comprehensive, I feel, is definitely the, that definition of happiness by Ibn Khaldun. And to recap, that definition states that happiness is when every natural in the inclination in the human achieves what it desires and it does so in accordance with its nature. When that, ha when that happens, a person achieves happiness. And the sum total of all of those internal inclinations is what is truly the measure of happiness that we feel. In the last session, we explored that a little bit more. We looked at, with greater sort of depth, the idea that for some of us, happiness is only our external facets, our body. But the reality of it is that it's more than that. For some people, there is a happiness that's found through pursuing those things of the intellect. That is another facet. But in reality, Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam and our saintly scholars have come to us with much more. They've explained to us the true cosmology, the true structure of our inner world and our inner lives. And the reason why that was important was, again, those are some of the essential components of the human being. If we ignore them, we fall into peril. If we don't meet their needs in accordance to their nature, we fall into suffering. And so, therefore, we must understand what those internal components are. The one component that we touched upon briefly in our last session was that of the heart. And we began that with reminding ourselves of the statement of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, where he said in the Quran that, you know, oh my Lord, do not disgrace me on that day of resurrection, the day where wealth and children will be of no avail, except for that person that comes to Allah with a heart that is salim or pure and clean. And that heart was not the physical heart, it's the spiritual heart. So at this stage, we have the beginning of our journey into what is not physical, what is not mental. And these are the essential components of the human being. This is important as we develop our theory of happiness, as we develop how it is we are to truly perceive happiness. And this is extremely important because in today's society, these are rarely discussed. And if they are, they're often conflated. People sort of push together this idea of the soul or the spirit and the intellect. They push it, push it together such that it has no, no more true meaning anymore. They forget what its true value is. It's as if nowadays what we'd like to do in this particular session is, is enter a class. So imagine you're entering a class in your high school, and as you enter it, you're going to be talking about the systems in the body. And so there are many different systems that can be spoken about. One of the first systems that majority, I'm sure all of you know, is the skeletal system. Then another system that might be discussed is the digestive system. Another system is the cardiovascular system. But today we're going to discuss some components of the human being that are more important. It's as if we have these various systems in the human, but we also have the spiritual system. And this is the system of greatest importance to the human being. Scholars in the past have given a very powerful and beautiful analogy of a rider. And that rider rides a horse and he stops at this, let's say, an inn. 
for our purposes. And as he stops at the inn, he gets off the horse. And when that person comes to take the horse and the rider into the inn, what do they do? They take the horse and the horse is taken into the stable. It's given a bed of hay. It's given, you know, food uh, to eat, coarse food. It's brushed with a harsh, you know, stiff brush in order to clean it. And that's where it's laid to sleep. But the rider, the rider does not enter the stable. To be hosted appropriately, the rider is taken into the house. The house, the, in that house, the rider is fed with the most delicious of food on the most uh, beautiful of plates, and then he's given to rest and to bathe in a you know, luxurious, luxurious bath, then given a bed that's comfortable, that's filled with you know, sheets and pillows that are soft to the touch. The idea being here is that these are the two components in a human being. There is the rider, and then there is the mount. And in the case of humans, our scholars have said that this is akin to the idea of the spirit, the ruh, and the body. The body can be fed with, you know, bread and water. Whereas the spirit, what does it require? If we do not give it what it requires, it's as if we take the rider and we say, you cannot stay in the house and do not feed it. Or it's as if we take the rider and put him in the stable and say, here, sleep on hay, be brushed with this coarse brush, and we take the animal, the mount, and we take that into the house and we give it of our finest food and of our luxurious uh, furniture that, that, that to afford it its comfort. That's the way. We have to understand that we have a body and we have a soul and we need to understand how and where to place importance such that we can maximize our own happiness. So in this class, as we're looking at the systems, we start to look at what is our spiritual system. And so our spiritual system is composed of many parts, but it's also connected to our physical system as well. So the first element in this spiritual system that we will look at is actually that physical component. So imagine a circle, and in the bottom of the circle, we have the word jawarih, or limbs. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an, in many places, He speaks about our limbs. He speaks about the consequences of what our limbs reap. And it's a very powerful discussion because each of these components has its own paradigm, its own understanding in the Qur'an. And each of these really do require a longer discourse. But for the sake of brevity, the limbs are those external elements of the human being. The hands, the feet, the stomach, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an where he describes in one verse the idea of the limbs, he says that corruption has manifested on the lands. بِمَا ظَهَرَتْ أَيْدِ nas For from what the hands have manifested. And in that ayah Allah goes on to speak about so that they will taste some of the consequences. Perhaps they might return. A beautiful discussion about not only the limbs and the effects of our limbs, in the world, but also about the consequences of our actions. And even, subhanAllah, as a side note, an incredible discussion about modern environmentalism and what it means. But irrespective, the first component in our system are our limbs, the jawarih. Now the next component in our system sort of sits above the limbs, and that system is the aql. How many places are in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the human, He says to humanity, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Will you not reason? Will you not reflect? So that second component of the human being is the idea of the intellect, the rational faculties of the human being. And in our diagram, I would put that intellect above the limbs because the idea would be is that the intellect commands the limbs and the limbs act. Now, this is important for us to understand because now we're looking at the two core ways in which people view happiness. And let's remember that happiness is the sum total of all our inner faculties, our inner senses. So there's some people that are going to pursue happiness based solely on their limbs. They are a physical body, materialism. That's all that I am. Therefore, I only pursue m bodily happiness. And in a sense, these people are going to be happy, but they're going to be the happiness 
of a body. And remember, when we looked at the ideas of duration, intensity, etc., that's the level that they find happiness on. The next level that people pursue happiness and see happiness from is from the level of the intellect, the level of, you know, using our intellect to solve problems, to face challenges intellectually, etc. And that's another level of happiness. But these are just two components of our fuller system. It's as if we are in a room that has essentially completely walled off walls. We cannot see out except for perhaps a few kind of keyholes. And in that first keyhole, as we look through it, we see mm, the ground, we see dirt. And we look at it and we think to ourselves, that's the world. It's just this, it's brown, it's dirt, it's, it's, that's it, right? The level of the body, physicality. Then at the level of the next one, you look through another hole and you see some greenery. And you think, think to yourself, ha, huh, that's the world. That's all there is. There's just greenery and there's some dirt and that's it and that's all I see. But the reality of it is that that's for people that perceive the world in a very myopic way. Because now we're going to get into the spiritual elements of the human being. And when we see these spiritual elements, it's as if that person looking at a keyhole here and a keyhole there suddenly lifts their gaze to a room with no roof. And through that view, they see the stars, the heavens, the celestial bodies, and they begin to recognize that there is so much more to what they see than just the tiny keyholes in which they look. And so now, as we get to this level, the first element in our spiritual system is the qalb. And as we mentioned last time, that is the determinant for our happiness, our everlasting happiness in the hereafter, is if we come to Allah with a heart that is pure, not the physical heart. And the purpose of the heart is to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship Him. And this heart in the Islamic spiritual system, the cosmology, the way of understanding ourselves, it actually sits above the intellect. Now this is critical because what this means is the way my heart is, that is the way my intellect will reason. And the way my intellect reasons is the way my limbs will be forced to execute. The heart is the CEO. It's the chief executive officer of the body. It's the determinant, the wellspring from which my thoughts come. It's the wellspring from which my actions then emanate from my body. Now, the heart, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, as we mentioned, no one will benefit on that day except the person that comes with a pure heart. Allah also says in other ayat that it's not the eyes that go blind, but the hearts in the chests in, in the, the hearts in the chests that go blind. So it's the hearts that see. Now this heart is able to look into two things. So the heart looks into the nafs, and the nafs is our self. In the, in the Qur'an, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describing the Qur'an in very ma many ways. The nafs that commands to evil, the reproachful self, a nafsul lawama, and a nafsul mutma'inna, the tranquil self. And so the nafs can be of various types. The one that just commands to evil, now that evil nafs. The one that's reproachful, that's between the state of goodness and evil, constantly in battle. As well as the tranquil self, the self that has manifested itself now in this world of goodness. And then we have the heart, it looks into the nafs, but the heart also looks into the world of the ruh. The ruh is the spirit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that he breathed into Adam of his spirit. And these are incredible ayah to reflect on even to what we're going to discuss today. Because Adam was, he was created by Allah in his form, his physical form. And at that point, did the angels bow down to Adam? The jinn, did they bow down to Adam? No. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He blew into him of his spirit. At that stage, did Adam alayhi salam, our father, become to that degree and status that then the angels and the jinn were told to bow down to him? It's as if it's, a, it's, a, it's an indication that what makes us special is not the body, but what makes us special is the ruh. 
And so the heart can look into the nafs and the heart can look into the ruh, the world of the spirit, of that which we know very little, but it's connected to the world of the divine. And depending on how purified the nafs is, the heart will have more and more access into the heavenly world of inspiration and of other things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. And so what we have now is we have an understanding of this spiritual system. The heart will be a specific state. It will look into the nafs. Depending on what the nafs is, the heart has, be, has a nature that develops. The heart looks into the world of the ruh if it can, in a sense, because of the state of the nafs. And then the heart commands the intellect. The intellect commands the limbs. Now, here is where the happiness and the nature of the heart become manifest. Depending on the state of a person's heart is the way in which they're going to perceive happiness. It's the way in which they're going to pursue happiness. And so our scholars like Imam Ghazali and others, they've discussed the various ways in which a nafs can manifest itself. One of the ways in which a nafs can be is a nafs can be animalistic in nature. And so this is a nafs that finds happiness through eating, drinking, sleeping, and copulating. That's the way the nafs finds happiness. And so when a nafs becomes this in its dominant form, it then becomes the means by which the heart sees. And so the heart sees happiness only in being an animal and is a person who takes on these behaviors, takes on these traits and these pursuits, are they happy? Yes, they are happy, but they're happy as an animal and they can only achieve the happiness that an animal can achieve. Then they speak about the nafs that is predatory, is sab'i. And the nafs that is predatory, it attains its happiness through predation through violence, through anger, through aggression, through us usurping, through taking what others have. And so the nafs that has become like this, that's how the heart sees the happiness. It pursues it in this way, by being aggressive, by being sort of angry, mean, wanting to take things. Then the nafs can be shaytani, it can be satanic in nature. And how does a shaytan achieve happiness? Through lying, through deceit through cheating, through wanting to own the hearts of men. And the nafs that becomes shaytani, satanic in its nature, how does it perceive happiness? Well, it perceives happiness through those actions. Now there's a fourth kind of nafs, and that nafs is the malaiki nafs, the angelic nafs. Now how do angels perceive happiness? Well, through connecting to the divine, through dhikr, through fasting, for example, not eating through ilm, through knowledge. And so the state of the nafs is really what becomes the determinant factor for who we are inside. Now, these three components, animalistic component, the idea of being a predator, the idea of being a shaytan, and the idea of being a malaika or angelic, they have their manifestations on all levels of existence from the political level to where we see societies based solely on the acquisition of wealth to satiate their bodily desires, through to the level of communities, the way com we behave in our communities, even at the level of school. You know, when I think about high school and I think about some of the challenges that, you know, I felt that other people felt in high school, what were some of them? Some of them were actually related to these four categories. The idea of being an animal, pursuing just a bodily happiness. That's all that makes me happy. Pursuing a predatory happiness. How much of our world nowadays is filled with violence, with filled with aggression, where that is seen to be the sort of the best that we can be. Those people that are most highly regarded are the most aggressive, the most angry. How much of our lives that we see, perhaps in high school, on the news, etc., is all about this idea of aggression taking, being seen to be the alpha male, you know, being seen to be the one who has the most in terms of 
prestige through usurping and taking from others. How much of our happiness is now even in shaitani happiness? Why is it that the majority, at least nowadays, of modern television is all about this element of attaining happiness, sometimes through the pursuit of deceit, through lies? Why do we now glorify even the idea of shaitan in our television and movies, etc. Why? Because now we've developed nufus, we've developed selves that sort of orbit around these negative aspects that we can become. And when they do, that's how we perceive happiness. And that's how we pursue it. And when we pursue it, we do attain a degree of happiness, but it's paltry. It's base. It doesn't meet our true purpose, for we were created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then if the nafs becomes malaiki, angelic in nature, then one can only imagine the happiness, the complete happiness that comes to the human through that. And so one, asks, one might ask the question now, well, you know, now I can begin to see why I do certain actions. I can begin to see why I pursue this happiness or that happiness. But now in this framework, we must realize that the greatest happiness is that of the angel. The greatest happiness is that of pursuing a happiness that Allah has created us for. And so we come to the idea, if I want to be happy, I must understand that I'm more than a body. I must understand that I'm more than an intellect. I must understand that I have a spiritual system that I must meet its needs. And if I neglect that, I'm just going to be attaining a partial happiness. And now when I recognize that spiritual system, it needs to function in a certain way in accordance with its nature. And when I don't allow it, to function in accordance with its nature of worshiping Allah, of serving Allah, of being beautiful through good character, kindness, generosity, compassion, ge you know, all those wonderful elements, then I'm not giving it its nature. And when I don't give it its nature, I develop a happiness that is sick. A happiness based on a predator, a happiness based on an animal, a happiness based on a shaitan, and this is an incomplete happiness. And so then the question is, how do I attain happiness? Well, the secret to happiness then is tazkiyah. It's the process in which we clean our heart, we clean our nafs such that we remove from it, not completely, but we remove from it the predominance of that animalistic behavior, that predatory behavior, that shaitani, that devilish behavior, such that we can attain and achieve the happiness of the angel. And that is the path to happiness. And so inshallah, in our next session, we will look at this idea of purification, how it works, how it functions, and what it means for the human being. Because now we have to understand that we're more than that body and we want to be complete human beings and we want to be hearts. And sometimes the terms heart, nafs, ruh are used together, but in this stage we want to understand those differences because of that system, understanding the spiritual system and why we need to purify that spiritual system is the true core of attaining happiness in this life and the next. جزاكم الله خيرا والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته سبحانك اللهم وبهمدك نشهد أن